On Saturday, January 9th of 2016, friends of Fred Turton gathered at Rudyard's Pub, where he bartended for nearly two decades, to celebrate his life and share memories, anecdotes, and stories about him. I just want to take a few minutes to uh, thank everyone for being here, not that that's necessary. It's interesting that we, uh, how many people I've met since we got here today that said, uh, so nice to see you, so nice to see everybody. You know, uh, wish it wasn't under these circumstances. Well, it is, you know, and it's part of the, part of the life start is the, uh, the life ending or passing on, whatever. And um, this has been tough for many, many people. Uh, Fred had a very uh, iconic uh, personality, which is something, if you mention to him, well, he wasn't big at school slapping people but he would disdain you pretty good he he would kind of go like this I know because it's happened many many times in my presence mostly directed toward me he took in a very giddy uh, overexcited excitable boy when I first met him about 17 years ago it was very patient with me appreciated something in me and uh, we collaborated on a bunch of stuff as many people here in the room have. Everybody had the opportunity to uh, participate with uh, Fred Turton's uh, imaginations and uh, ruminations and his art. Much of his writings were inspired by his time behind the bar here at Rudyard's. Uh, many of his stories came from things that he heard this way or things that he heard straight at him. And, uh, and he always changed the names. Nobody, you know who you were talking about, you, but he didn't use your name, you know. He, but in, in using someone, the names he used was just a, a tribute to his cleverness and his uh, way of words. He lived life as he wanted to, as he certainly did, and I believe he left us as he wanted to. And for that, I, uh, I love him even more. But ultimately, enough about me and my experience with him. Everyone will have a chance who cares to, to get up and express their regard, uh, their feelings, their humorous, uh, you know, no notes, please. You know, it's a bad sign. If somebody shows up here with a long list of notes and it drops out like this, it's best to just we all give them the frit. Turn your chairs around. But everybody feel, that's, feel, express what you're feeling. Enjoy yourself. And let's just remind, be reminded for a moment that look what's happened to Fred that's brought us together happens every day to many. And maybe uh, it's easy for us to look at the loss and that's where we feel bad, makes us feel bad because I won't see him again. But maybe I'll embrace that how precious my life is, how life, how precious life is in general. Maybe we'll be happy to, a little kick in our step when we walk out of here today, knowing that life is good, and hope that I uh, and we live life as good as Fred Turton did. So thank you very much for your time, enjoy yourself. You know, I can't wait to hear all the stories and walk by conversations and hear what you all have to say about, each, about Fred to each other. All right, lessons to all. Oh, uh, one last thing. We have a, uh, Har uh, Larry Winters is here from the Spare Chain Show, KPFT. <clears throat> As you know, uh, his the, Fred's minutes after the public news was the public news or the, yeah. Yeah. Uh, went off the air or went, went out of print. He went to uh, KPFT, met this guy, and uh, he's been on the air. How many episodes now? Uh, Six hundred and so. 600 and change episodes that's 600 weeks that he just that he's been on kpft so uh i used to meet every once in a while i meet larry and fred at the same time and it was really a pleasure the banter of these fellows so i'll give it to larry because he has to go and then we have uh, 4 30 approximately uh we have uh, necessary tension we call them nervous tension all week and uh i give you the rest of the day thank you Thank you.
that's the kind of a chaplain we need, you know, somebody who is, uh, who's real, you know, and they ain't going to try to sell us nothing. But uh, Fred was one of the most real persons I ever met. He, uh, and Doc explained him pretty well that, that turning his head and just kind of walking away, you, he didn't have to say, screw you. He, he, he did it. And uh, when he first came up to me, uh, when we had a regime change at KPFT, we went from uh, kind of uh, Americana top 40 kind of uh, uh, airplay to back to Pacifica where we wanted to bring some creativity from the uh, uh, audience or from the uh, community. And uh, I was reading, somebody mentioned that Fred, um, Helga Beermeister and uh, uh, Drew Bradford, and I'm going, well, I'd like to meet those people. Well, the only thing that showed up was Fred. And he was, uh, he was such a treat. And his politics actually changed by hanging around KPFT and hanging around me. I'm kind of a leftist, uh, sorta. <laughs> you know, I believe in equality, you know, but if I had a billion dollars, I'd probably think differently. But, uh, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer in guns and beer and all the rest of the stuff, but nobody put a story together about guns and beer like Fred did. Because Fred really made it, made made us made me think and made Houston think about the insanity of the rat race, of the pettiness of humanity at times, and also the joy of being alive. Fred gave meaning to life to a lot of people because he was uh, he was very genuine. And I, I put a thing on Facebook today, on Larry Winter's Facebook. It was Stephen Bruton talking about his epiphany uh, after he was diagnosed with cancer and knew he was dying. But he said, this moment may be the, as good as it's ever going to be. So, you know, we have to remember that because none of us are promised tomorrow. And when Fred didn't show up that Saturday to the radio station, station like he always did at 11.30 with his little old M MG or little old Triumph or whatever it was, Miata. Yeah. Well, it's MG ripoff, you know, <laughs> Japanese MG ripoff. But uh, he, uh, I, was, I said, well, I guess he's just going to come in at uh, 1 o'clock and read it live. He didn't show up at 1 o'clock. I started worrying. Then I get a message from Doc Wednesday saying call and uh, I knew something was up and then uh, found out he passed away. But y'all just remember that uh, we're all here for just for a short time. But it was a real pleasure to get to meet Doc and Fred and Helga Beermeister and uh, Drew Bradford. Thanks for uh, coming up and supporting uh, such a fine human being. Thanks for supporting KPFT if y'all ever do. Yes, I was just a little kid. I was only 28 when I met Fred. But he taught me a lot. You know, he was bartending. He was an artist. I mean, he saw Vaney t made a portrait of herself outside. But he had he had a sense of humor. Well, Fred took me hunting one time. And we shot Bammy. But boy, could he make some venison. <laughs> but he was an incredible dart thrower, and he taught me how to do, I mean, the trophies you see downstairs, fair was cool. But reality is, I learned a lot, I learned a lot from Fred, and it was, it was awesome, you know, and I have a lot of respect for him, and, and all the stuff he did at the West Hummer Art Festival, y'all don't know about that, he did a lot of things at the Art Festival before it became this little stupid thing, you know, in a parking lot. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. But Fred, you know, he had a weird sense of humor, and I could deal with it. <laughs> but he was a good man, and I have a lot of respect for him. 
and what he did for the little children make a wish foundation for the Montrose Beer and Gun Club. Cheers. And he always, he always talked really gruff, you know. I was like, he was always talking real gruff, like I don't, I don't want my picture taken. I'm taking it anyway. <laughs> I'm taking it anyway. But here's, here's a friend. He was our friend. And mm -hmm. hey, I'm still throwing a good dart. <laughs> God bless y'all, and thank you for letting me stay. Hello, my name's Sol. I'm part of the Dubnitsa chapter of the Montrose Beer and Gun Club. I'll tell a few stories. I've known um, Fred for about uh, it's about 18 years. I came to Houston in, in 97, and it's been good to me, so I've stayed. So I befriended um, Fred when I started living around the corner at the time on Indiana Street and uh, got involved knowing him would stay, and when he'd finish his shift, have a meal with him. So I was able to attend um, the first um, the first Montrose Beer and Gun Club in a backyard, and then the second one where um, I got one of the Locked and Loaded Awards. But anyway, after doing that and knowing that he was building something and building this community, I wanted to do something to recognize him. So at the time I was in graduate school and uh, I would have to give seminars. So I said, hey Fred, um, why don't you come down with me to the um, medical center, I want to show you what I do. And just the year before, before we had gotten involved with uh, Make-A-Wish, which is a great foundation, the first time he had done a donation, he did it to the MD Anderson Cancer Center. Just kind of walked down unceremoniously, gave a, gave a check in the accounts receivable office, and then took a cab home, you know, didn't have any recognition, just started it. I did it all on his own. And when I heard that story, it's like, we need to do something more since I was associated with that institution. So. I brought him down, and it was interesting because he put on a button-up dress that day, and we kind of walked in. But I got up and did my, um, to introduce my seminar, I said, before I start today, I want to say we have an honored guest here, Mr. Fred Turton, who's a philanthropist. And in the back of the room, he went, ha! <laughs> so it was really interesting. He was not expecting that, and uh, but it was important to recognize him as a philanthropist because that's who Mr. Fred Turton is. Um, you know, and so over 15 years, we have, you know, a community of hundreds of thousands of dollars that we put together. So I, I'm glad I was able to do that early on for this, this legacy. Another good story to tell is I um, took some dart lessons from Fred once, and I was going all over the board. And Fred said, you know, Soul, what are you doing? And I was doing all this other stuff, and he's like, Soul, you, the dart, the board, throw it. Very simple, straightforward way of looking at things. Not, you know, full of all this complicated stuff like our lives in Houston are. After he said that, I started hitting where I needed to go. So Fred kept things simple, straightforward. I think a very good lesson for all of our lives. So, you know, the last thing to say is that Fred's openness and welcoming to all of this community is a really great one. Because the Montrose Beer and Gun Club has people from all over the world, all walks of life. Some of us make it. Paycheck to paycheck, some of us are very wealthy. But what matters is he came out with an open heart to all of us and did something with an open heart. And with that, here's to Fred. Thank you, everyone. There was a half-smoked cigarette still in the ashtray. No one wanted to touch it. I think we all needed to think he'd be back to light it up. It would be lovely to think so, as Fred would say. This is a very difficult time for us all in this room and his family back home, but we will persevere because that's who we are. Fred would often use his best rando voice from on the waterfront. I could have had class. I could have been a contender. I could have been somebody. Well, Fred was a video technician in the army and later for Shell Oil. He studied graphic arts and was indeed an artist. Some of his work is on the slideshow that I put together. He was a bartender, a darts player extraordinaire, writer of the Montrose Beer and Gun Club Chronicles, the radio voice of Drew Bradford. He was an entrepreneur, a lover of baseball and football. Not that, uh, it wasn't in, into that loud stuff they do at the expense of arenas, but into the pure games of baseball and football. He was also a fisherman. Fred loved to fish. 
He was well-read, creative, philosophical, humble, insightful, humorous, generous, sharp, analytical, satirical, and he enjoyed a twisted joke. If you were the person directly in front of him, you got his full attention, either to, do, to your delight or to your detriment. Because he was forthright, honest to a fault, he could cut to the heart of a subject with the same precision that he threw darts. And many of you knew he excelled in that department. He didn't like loud music and he shied away from loud people. How many of us at some point have heard him yell, hey, I'm trying to have a conversation here. <laughs> then without missing a beat, he would calmly slip back into his baritone, now, where was I? There are several stories of how the Montrose Beer and Gun Club idea first sprang up and surely though we can all agree that it happened in the Rudyard's ghetto while Fred was either bartending or standing on the other side of the bar. This is where creative people bantered and smart-assed their way through many an evening. It was sort of like the Bohemian artists did in Paris in the 1920s. When, and one thing is certain, Fred took the Montrose Beer and Gun Club concept and ran with it. He made it into both a literary legend and also a damn fine fundraising organization. Fred wanted to leave something behind, and he proved to us all that you don't have to be wealthy to do so. Well, kids, I wish things were better, but look around you. We're all a little better for having known you, Fred. And by the way, you definitely had class. And you definitely were somebody. Hey, all right. Well done. I remember sitting down in the red zone with Fred when he gave out our Montos Beer and Club membership cards and I have my laminated, it's member 002. And uh, it was, we, uh, we were one of the five original members and it got started from when we used to go meet here, several of us, and when we go down to the gun range and go shooting, then we come back and drink beer and brag about it. And then, of course, Fred took it brilliantly and said, what if we did the opposite? We drank beer first, and then we went go shooting, and then, then brag about it or miss it or screw up somewhere. So that's where the Monto Spear and Gunk idea came from. But Fred took it right out there and did beautifully. And the memberships, you know, were just wonderful. And the thing that Fred did for the, for the charity and all the goodness he brought, was just something we'll never forget and we'll always be happy about. But I have one story about Fred that I remember. <clears throat> it's one afternoon we were sitting there at the in the red zone and uh, Fred was tending bar downstairs and the Saturday afternoon club, I think it's called the Black Rose. I don't remember what the name of this group is. They had met and they had left some flyers and Fred had got hold of one of the flyers and he looked at it in his gruff voice and he said, oh, look at this. And they got rules on how to set fire to each other. <laughs> and I thought that was typical of Fred's sarcastic, wonderful sense of humor. And I thank you all. And God bless Fred. And let's uh, have a drink to those friends of ours who are gone, Fred included. I would like to take a moment to uh, tell you a little bit about a Fred that a lot of us don't know. I um, illegally entered a bar called Rudd's in about 1979, I was 16. One of the first people I ever met was Fred at Rudyard's, and he uh, wanted to teach me dart throwing. But what I, where I want to go with Fred is that the Fred was a very artistic person. He was an artist, and it, it, his mind was very creative. And uh, I think that even before the Montrose Beer and Gun Club, we could see a spark of creativity that uh, lit up everybody's life. One of the things that Fred was, was a real good sense of people. And many years later, and the Beer and Gun Club came about. And it, the Beer and Gun Club, beautiful it is, it's not just all Fred. Fred was many people. But uh, back to where I was saying, many years ago, later, 
one of the things that he loved about each and every one of you was that he came to me and said, Tara, it's just amazing. I could never imagine that everybody knew their place. Nobody had to be told what place to take or what to do. Everybody here was together, joined, in, in Fred being the light, the fire of creativity that uh, held us all together. Now we can all look around, we can all give ourselves a pat on the back because he has led us through his light to a better world for all of us. Thank you, Fred. You were more like a father figure to me. Bye. All right, I met Fred uh, back a while back. Uh, John, the, one of the guys that works here, he had the Houston Other paper and it opened up after the press fell, <laughs> public news. And, uh, and we, I was a photographer for him, not very known photographer, a good photographer. But uh, Fred was uh, introduced me as a writer, and I said, uh, he goes, I'm not a writer. I said, well, I'm not much of a photographer. <laughs> so, and then, uh, as we all know, that paper went real far. But <laughs> uh, <laughs> so um, later, many, many, many years later, I got into the Montrose Beer and Gun Club and uh, got to meet Fred a few times, and he was always come over and check out our trophies, and he'd go, these are really nice. <laughs> he'd fall into our trophies and walk away, and it was an annual thing every year for Fred to come up before it started and to touch our trophies <laughs> and admire them. And it was great to know him, and I don't think, uh, it, you know, I'd be great. You know, the Montrose Beer, and Cl Beer Club has really uh, brought our team, St. Chicken, together and a lot of other people together, and that's a great thing you know I don't know what to do without it so I want to thank Fred for making that happen and you know making that club all right thank you very much <laughs> I wasn't really part of the very beginning we discovered the Montrose Beer and Gun Club through a fellow named Ian who used to sit at the end of the bar downstairs and so we went yes don't do that to me anyway um, we, uh, uh, my lovely wife and I went to one of the, the uh, gun club cook-offs that was in a backyard and maybe a, a second one. And I want to testify to Fred's legacy because I was the biggest advertiser for the Montrose Beer and Gun Club cook-off. And this is why. And it, it has to do with an anecdote. One day, my wife and I got down there. We had rice. We had chicken and sausage gumbo. And there was a team next to us, and they had come from Mississippi. And they had alligator stew, but they forgot the rice. And so it was really cool, the nature of that whole cook-off, the whole wonderful part of the camaraderie of the Montrose Beer and Gun Club cook-off. Hey, here, have some of our rice. We just live a couple blocks away. I'll go get some more. And the, by the way, their alligator stew was incredible. So part of Fred's legacy is the nature of having a cook-off where you don't go down to the rodeo and have a miserable time. You go to the backyard or the West Alabama Ice House and you have a marvelous time. Everybody's got a smile on your face. You've got uh, jalapeno margaritas whoever the guy is that makes those wonderful jalapenos that are stuffed. I mean, yeah, I thought, I thought that was you. That is the legacy that Fred has blessed us with. Thank you. Since 1987, I've known Fred even earlier than that. He invited me to join his dart team because he thought I could throw. I'm sorry, because... The first game of the season, I showed up with a broken leg, and he didn't kick me off the team. And we wound up earning one of the tallest trophies in the house. Sat up there for 20 years almost. Fred's a swell guy. He put up with me many, many nights when he shouldn't have. And so I'll just say, do the do. 
Well, I just wanted to get a word in because everyone's talking about the Montrose Beer and Gun Club, which is an incredible thing that brought a lot of artistic and talented groups together in Houston, in the middle of Houston, that was founded by Fred and Ian and Sam and a few others, Gordon. And I was there, but they forgot to give me a card. And <laughs> I didn't get a card till much later. But um, another thing that's, that, that, that Fred did that I think we need to recognize is he, ha he was responsible for bringing in, a, this is my specific interest and in a lot of others that are here, the incredible legendary jazz jam that was here in Rudyard's um, for so many years, um, headed by Bob Chadwick and Harry Shepard and Necessary Tension, their group. And Fred was an avid jazz lover, which is why I loved him so much in addition to everything else I loved about him. And he was responsible for getting in here and always played jazz at happy hour. <laughs> and Fred was one of the real people. You knew exactly where he was. He was genuine, no BS, no phoniness, get to the chase, tell it like it is, which a lot of jazz people are. <laughs> but, uh, I'll miss him dearly, and his legacy lives on, and uh, I'm, I'll, I'll be happy to hear Bob and Harry again today. So thank you. So my wife and I do the Montrose Bear Gun Club website, and we've been doing it for quite a while. Um, we met in August before the Bear and Gun Club. This last one just went off, and we had a meeting he was going to put he wanted to quit doing what he was doing, which was writing the stories and, and do a best of. He wanted to take a break. He wanted a little hiatus. So when we met that day, um, he, he promised he would do that. And we'd been telling this story forever. It's about when our child was born. Donna was in the hospital. We went in for like a checkup. She had something go on. So we went in for a checkup. And uh, the doctor said, well, you have to stay overnight. And I said, well, what do I do, Don? I have a dart match. She goes, well, go play your dart match. It's okay, I'll be fine in the hospital. So we got to tell Fred this story that day in August when I took pictures of the new hats that he had for the, for the cook-off. So we told him the story. And it's myself and Donna chiming in back and forth about what happened. I'm playing darts. The phone rings at the bar. And this is back when the uh, when Rudyard's had a phone booth between the bathrooms downstairs. So he goes, hey Medina, you got a phone call. Go pick it up. So go over there, pick up the phone. He goes, damn it, you better get here in 30 minutes. This is Donna talking. I don't know what Fred's deal is, but if you don't get here in 30 minutes, the doctor says that you know your baby's gonna be born here and miss it. So I hang up the phone, I go back to these people that I'm playing darts with, I go, gonna have a baby, gotta go. They say, I'll go, get, get out of here. He had never heard this story, he was just bright-eyed, like he, but we all laughed about it, and it was funny. And we always loved that about him, he was just the funnest guy. So anyway, the, the guy that was here that did the show with him, I chased him out to his car, he had one CD left that, he had never, he used to drop off, here at Rudyard's, he used to drop off a big pack of CDs so that we would take them, put them on to the website. Donna did all the work on that so that y'all could hear them. But before that, you know, he would write them to us. And that was the funniest thing, that he would write the whole story out. And here's Donna, perfectionist, she's sitting there proofreading. He goes, oh, no, 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 don't, don't change the words. Do it the way I like it. I mean, the way I wrote it, because of the way he spoke. Y'all and this and that and, and fix it and all that stuff. So anyway, we still want to keep the website going. We have the last CD that the guy gave me, and he's going to arrange to give us the last poem that he read. I think it was a Yates poem. Yeah. I'm not sure. 
and uh, get those last minutes that I sat in my truck and just remembered him. So everybody remember him as a good guy. And like Casey said, do it. <laughs> so sad to uh, have events like this where you get to see all the old crowd come back in, faces you don't see for uh, years and years at a time, and, and then, you know, we get back together to celebrate somebody's life, and, and you think, why don't we do this more often? But that's, you know, that's the way life is. I've been, uh, I've been the owner of Rugs now for 23 years, and uh, 23 years ago, when I bought it, there were five bartenders here, and Fred was one of them. I had uh, almost a bartender in every decade, you know, 20-something, 30-something, 40-something. Fred was the 50-something. So, uh, and just iconic, you know. I mean, immediately you recognize that about him. And uh, he did sort of pass away at an unfortunate time between putting up beer markers and taking down the dart trophies and getting them resituated to go in the back room, but Fred was personally responsible for many of those dart trophies, if not on the team himself, helping people form teams and giving them a lot of support in going forward in their game and, uh, and, and, and improving, um, you know, learning about the beer dart ratio. So... <laughs> Anyway, uh, you know, I, I do want to go back to sort of first impressions. I mean, um, you know, Fred immediately struck me as a man of, uh, of a sort of impossible kind of configuration. I mean, he was very disciplined with a military background, yet he was an artist. And he was a man who had very strong uh, values and very, and very specific, a very specific outlook on life, and yet, he was incredibly fun-loving and could be very spontaneous. And, you know, he loved his tipple. He loved to, you know, have a little smoke. He loved to, like, you know, settle in and have long conversations about, you know, life and stuff. Important things and not important things. Fred was just great. Anyway, um, he was also sort of, you know, one of those kind of, avuncular type guys who always had like a bit of uh, advice for you and one of the things that uh, Fred told me early on was you know you know you're gonna find out that the first 10 years of earning a bar they're the hardest <laughs> okay Fred thanks for that so uh, so Fred basically was here 90 93 and then um, uh, after a while, I basically bought the building and did an expansion. And in doing that, at a certain point, we got to we moved forward and we expanded, and we got to a point where I brought in a POS system. <laughs> I think some of you know how this goes. The POS system that I first brought in was the Aloha system. <laughs> So Fred came in one day and he said, you know what I found interesting? He's like, the word aloha, it means hello and goodbye. <laughs> He's like, I've put up with everything you've done, but this is, uh, I'm done. Aloha. <laughs> I said, okay. I said, okay, Fred, I, I can dig that. I can dig that. And, uh, you know, that's probably the last time he was on this stage up here was for his... Uh, for his uh, retirement party, and he had been a bartender at Rudyard's at that point for 17 years. Yeah. He had been with me nine. And at one point, about a year later, when we were when we were talking Montrose Beer and Gun Club stuff or doing whatever, I said, you know, to Fred, it's been 10 years, and you told me the first 10 years were hardest. And he winked and said, yeah. But I didn't tell you that the rest of the years were going to be much easier. <laughs> okay. Anyway, have a little shot for Fred. Tell him more do. Thank you. Okay, we'll take a little break uh, if everything's, everybody's okay with that. And that break will uh, give the band a chance to set up. We'll listen to some beautiful music. We'll dance and sing. And then we'll have the official handshake. 
of the Montrose Beer and Gun Club. So enjoy. Talk quietly or loudly amongst yourselves. Ladies and gentlemen, introducing the inimitable Necessary Tension. You can introduce your band members. Bob Chadwick. Harry Shepard. Richard Talaki. Aaron Wright. And let's celebrate a life of a wonderful human being with the uh, secret handshake of the Montrose Beer and Gun Club. It's no secret, all our hands shake. Fred Turton. Thank you. 
Richard and myself and another base, uh, guy named Jay Cruz were here. Uh, we had another gig, right? We had, right, we had, we had a, a rock and roll gig uh, scheduled 
and the guy who was in charge of the rock and roll band was late, and we were just hanging out, and we started playing jazz, and Fred heard it and said, let's start doing this every Thursday. And that's how Necessary Attention started. Uh, it was really kind of Fred's whole thing. Really, really was. And, and this, this whole thing is, you know, thank you so much, Fred. We miss you so much. And, you know, uh, very often, Fred was very particular about what he liked in jazz, so he wouldn't always come out and say we sounded good. But, but when we were kicking it really hard, he would come out from behind the bar, leave his customers, and come out right up to the bandstand and scream and howl. And it was just a wonderful thing, and, 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 but he wasn't, he was very particular about when he would do that, so we had to be playing good, you know, to that. so Fred, Fred again, here's to Fred, we miss you so much, thank you so much. Those of you who know me, I do that, that I run the cook teams at the cook-off. Um, I normally get a little choked up when I'm doing the cook teams. I'm gonna, I've, I've had a few Tullamore dues, so I'm gonna try to make this work without crying because I've got tissues, but no handkerchief from dog. Hey, Fred Janice, the dish um, today. <laughs> Fred, Fred did get us a discount on Tullamore dew today because, you know, he's awesome, like that. Um, with regard to Fred, I really have no words. I really don't. It was an honor. It was a privilege. Um, so a Fred story. For those of you who don't know Fred's story. The first time I went with the Montrose Bear and Gun Club to, to give money to make a wish, I was very, I, I was verklempt. I was choking up. Imagine that. And couldn't quite get the dollar amount out and Doc was giving me a clean hex and Fred was standing there looking at me like, come on, Foreman, tell them what they tell them what they've won. So I gave all the checks to the the make a wish and then I, I had Fred's check in my pocket, stuck deep in my jeans pocket and I was crying and I was telling him like we raised seventeen thousand, blah 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 blah. Whatever the, whatever the number was. And then I reached in my pocket after it was over and pulled the Fred check out. And he was like, you know what? I think you were crying because you wanted to keep that check for yourself. <laughs> and that was just Fred's sense of humor. He was, an, he was awesome. And I will miss him horribly. But this will go on. And the kids will go on. Because his, his dream was that a community comes together and a community makes good things happen. And that's exactly what we're doing and what we have done. It's a community. That's why it's at the West Alabama Ice House. We are the Montrose. We will make this happen. And we will do good things. And we will do it for Fred. I tried to say this uh, last year. I broke out in tears. <laughs> Crying, get it over. Anyway, um, we all know Fred from our various stories and things that we've had with him, and he has never been a man that was lacking of words. Say amen on that one. Amen. Um, and he. As far as I've always remembered, because, you know, I am getting a little older now, and I did apply for Social Security, and I'm getting $901 in right February. Right but uh, as long as I remember that whenever you're having a conversation with Fred, it would always be no, not until I figured it out. And, you know, it's just no, you're just not right. Well, I, I came up with an idea about uh, this thing that uh, Fred was doing. The Montrose Beer and Gun Club, card carrying, shirt wearing members. And um, on any given night, you could be here and there'd be, you know, 20, 30 people. Card carrying, certified shirt wearing members. <coughs> and um, I was realizing that, no, this is not one of those fish, 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 I've had Tully too, fictitious things that are going on. And, yeah, fish tickets, fish tickets things that were going on. And I said, Fred, you know, we should probably get together and um, 
have a big old cook off or something and just you know big old party barbecue. and stuff with all barbecue with all the people that are involved and he said jim don't you uh, uh, mr settles don't you realize this is a purely fictitious organization i said fred i can look around and see 30 people around here that are card carrying shirt tote members or is it shirt wearing card tote members can't quite remember but anyway, uh, you know, days go by, and about a year later, he came up with the idea of doing it. And, and that's always good, because if his, his idea wants to do something and, you know, get him to, uh, get him to come up with an idea and follow through. Uh, he came, and, and what, the, what I'm trying to get to is the way that he would talk and always have a gift to gab. This is the story when I never seen, the first time I've ever seen, Fred Turton be speechless. Doc, you were there. And I was saying, you know, I've got a place we can come and have this little barbecue stuff. And um, that day came up, and Doc comes driving up, and Fred pulls out of the, you remember that, don't you? Yeah, yeah. He, he gets out of the car, and he looks up. No, there, there was... No, well, well, gang. No, there wasn't any of that. It was like he looked around, didn't say anything for a while, but finally he looked around and said, Wow. And uh, that's when uh, we finally decided to go ahead. Yes, this can be done. We can have a benefit to raise money for the kids. And uh, oh, shit, here I go, cry it again. <laughs> I'm done. When I first arrived here in Houston, I was looking for a place close by to the Chinese Communist Embassy consulate, right? Which just happened to be down the road by Kroger. So anyway, I looked up in the um, one ads and I found there was a place on Indiana Street, right around the corner from here. So I looked close enough and it looked presentable enough and it was cheap enough, so I decided I'd take it. Then came the problem of doing things like something to sleep on besides the floor, something to eat besides, um, what? I don't know. Didn't know. I hadn't, hadn't, hadn't thought that far ahead. But I did think far enough ahead to move some stuff in down to Texas City, which was in a, one of those storage places. So finally I decided, okay, this is the place that I had the stuff moved up, but it still took about a week to get it up here. In the meantime, I looked around for a place to eat, and I'd come around the corner, and I'd look, what did I stumble into? But Rudd's. And I said, this benevolent-looking fellow looking down at me with a mug of beer in one hand, and the wind was kind of moving him back and forth and saying, come on in, come on in, you found the place. So I went in, and um, I didn't really know what to eat, but I saw fish and chips up in the uh, menu. And being originally from New England, I said, well, fish and chips can't be too bad just about anywhere. And actually, the fish and chips were pretty darn good. But I still didn't know a soul here. And after two or three days, I got to talking with Fred, and I said, uh, uh, you know, I don't really know anybody here, and uh, I've just been here for a few days. I just moved here. And he said, well, you, then you better join the Montrose Beer and Gun Club. <laughs> well... I had nearly a fit of laughing, right? And he said, uh, "Just look us up on the look us up on the internet. Look for the, the Montrose Beer and Gun Club, right? You'll find us. You'll find us." And I said, "Well, how I, how do I go about joining?" He said, "Well, you just got to talk to Doc Doherty, and he'll take care of it." And Doc was uh, sitting down the end of the bar, right? And uh, he said, uh, "Well, what do you do?" And I said, well, uh, I'm a kind of a business person in marketing. I said, I just got back from China. He said, you just got back from China? What the hell are you doing in China? I mean, what are you doing? Are you doing business? How do you get by doing business over there in China? I said, well, I speak Chinese. He said, CIA. I said, CIA. He's the CIA, right? And, uh that's called and that, Chia. And after, after it kind of, the, the ruckus all settled down and they were convinced that uh, I wasn't CIA, I was NSA, they said, okay, well, that's not so bad. Because NSA didn't have a bad name back then. 
<laughs> We're talking about 13 years ago, right? Well, anyway, I followed Fred's advice and I joined the Montrose Beer and Gun Club. And uh, for 13 years, I couldn't tear myself away from hearing the companionship I get from the Beer and Gun Club. So I have stayed for 13 years right around the corner at that same goddamn place on Indiana Street. Thank you. My name is Erica Roberts, and I'm one half of Ricky and uh, Bo Bob. For those of you who have read um, many of Fred's stories, the Montrose Beer and Gun Club, um, some of my favorites that he wrote were actually about my children, Little Bo Bob and Barley. And uh, when Little Bo Bob burned up our microwave with the gummy bears, that is a true story. And uh, Fred took it and put it to paper. And um, I read it the night that I found out that he passed away and uh, brought back a lot of memories for me. Uh, I met Fred about 18 years ago, and I actually think I met him at Cecil's, not at Rudd's. And I introduced myself, said, hi, I'm Erica, and he goes, I'll never forget your name. My favorite niece is named Erica. And um, at that moment, he took me under his wing as if I were his niece, and he took my husband, Mo, under his wing, and we were friends for a long time. Um, and we spent many a, a time at some uh, Astros games. Um, back in my first stint working at the church, I was very fortunate to get a lot of free tickets to the Astros games at the Astrodome, and we would take Fred uh, often. So we had this bond over baseball and uh, friendship, and he just was a fun person once you got under all that curmudgeon. And we loved him, and we will miss him. And um, I am glad to say that I knew him. I'm also also known as the only major, major pregnant woman in the uh, very first photo of the Montrose Beer and Gun Club. Um, I was so pregnant, in fact, that day I thought I was going into false labor, and so I spent my day at the hospital, and they told me I was good, I could go, and I was like, good, because we've got a thing to go to. And we got to Jim Suttle's place, which, I'm sorry, my heart loved those, those early days of the Montrose Beer and Gun Club cook-off the best. Um, he told the cops and everybody, you need to you know, leave a lot of space here just in case we need an ambulance to come pick up this woman. Uh, I did not have my baby that day. She did not come until July 11th. It was the longest two extra weeks of my life. Um, so she was the first child member. Our daughter, Marley, was the first child member of the Montrose Beer and Gun Club. And our son, Reese, was the first in utero member of the Montrose Beer and Gun Club. And the first owner of a Montrose Beer and Gun Club one, onesie that Fred um, especially made for him, and he had also made for Marley a toddler-sized uh, Montrose Beer and Gun Club shirt with, you know, the original picture with the naked lady. So I take her around town with this naked lady picture on because I'm a good mom. <laughs> so those are my memories of Fred. Mo and I loved him immensely. Um, our kids knew him as the mysterious uncle who sent them amazing, cool, wonderful gifts at Christmas time. Um, our favorite being an old wind-up train that was, I don't know, probably from the late 60s or something that we still have and uh, will treasure forever and ever. Uh, good night, Fred. Miss you. Bye. <laughs> Fred had a nice effect on people, and uh, he was, to me, he was like a philosopher king. He, he said a couple of things that always stuck with me. One is that we're just pond scum. And that's, that's the way he looked at, at, at life and living. And the other thing he said is, I follow the people. He said, I follow the people. What the people wear, I wear. What the people talk about, I talk about. So, thanks, Fred. We're here to celebrate the life of Fred Turton. He was a man who never judged anybody. He let you be an asshole all on your own. He touched all of our lives and he brought us all together and he made us all better people. To Fred Turton and to Fiddler's Green. Thank you. Thank you guys for coming. Thanks for the food, all the guys who donated the food. 
thanks Lilia, Rudd, you know, you guys have done everything. This is one of Fred's places where he started and this whole thing started around Fred and the Dark League and the jazz band. So uh, we just want to thank Lilia, thanks the staff and everybody who did so much for us. Uh, once again, well, um, you know, the Montrose Beer and Gun Club is a group that, you know, we are, we're pretty much the neighborhood and everybody in here probably has done something for the group to help the group along. So none of it really works without all of us. So we really want to appreciate and thank all you guys for helping us out. And especially like the group who, you know, really, you know, docs, you know, everybody, Gordon, you know, Mary, Sue, you know, Bobby, you know, all the crews. But we want to thank you guys for everything you guys do. But we also want to thank you guys who, you know, we can't do anything to cook off. We can't do anything without you guys. So we really appreciate you guys being here for us right now when we need you guys. Um, I want to make sure everybody gets a chance to sign the book for Fred's uh, family. Uh, he has a sister, he has a couple older sisters, or older and a younger sister, and uh, we're going to make sure that they get a list of everybody who was here. Uh, the sister, one of the sisters has been here. She's familiar with a few people in the group and everything, so please make sure you get a chance to sign it. We also have a, a tip jar that we're raising money for the family, so uh, please feel free to donate to Fred and his family. But once again, uh, more importantly, we just want to thank you guys for coming, and we, we really appreciate it, and we couldn't do it without any of you guys and all of you guys, so thank you so much, okay? Thank you, Necessary Attentions, once again. Yeah.